We have a PhD on the subject, and that's a, a funny story. Um, I was just really, really lucky, to be honest. Um, I was born and raised in Brazil. Uh, I worked as a sysadmin for a long time in a, in a very large internet service provider there. And uh, I had mainly focus on, on storage administration of EMC and AdApp equipments. And um, I was doing a master's at the time in, in performance evaluation of some distributed algorithms. And I wanted to come to London and see a gig. Um, and my friend said, you cannot go to London just to see a gig, right? So uh, I came here and I said, OK, I'm, I'm also going to do some PhD interviews. And, um, and they happened to be looking for someone at Imperial College London for, um, for um, uh, the performance evaluation of virtualized storage. And I happened to have the industry experience and the academic experience with the, the evaluation stuff. So it was, it was a great match. And uh, at the end of my, of my PhD, I got an email from Citrix saying, hey, we've put together this performance team uh, for Zen Server. And uh, we're, we're looking for someone with specializing storage. <laughs> And I said, okay, I got lucky again. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's what I do now. Uh, so I work in the Zen Server Engineering team, uh, performance team, uh, and I take care of the storage bits. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, some of the, some a very, very uh, hot thing, a very new topic that we're, uh, we're coming across now. Um, I will start by talking a little bit about performance storage. I know we have uh, lots of researchers and sysadmins around here. And, and you're probably very well versed in this already, but uh, I'll cover a bit of it anyway. Um, talk a little bit about the trends in, in processors and storage and what's been happening at the moment and why we're having problems, essentially. And not only us, but everyone's going to start seeing this soon if they haven't already. Um, I'll go into uh, the Zen bits, showing how Zen, uh, the architecture components of Zen and how it virtualizes storage. And then finally, show you what the problems we have been encountering with the latest uh, storage the, uh, backends and devices and, and what are ideas we have on that. So there's a question, what is storage performance? So everyone bought, when, when you buy a new disk, this is probably the first thing that you do, right? Um, how many of you have used HD Parm? Yeah, all the hands are up. <laughs> so you do that or you do this, right? That's the other thing. How many of you have used DD? I was expecting to see less hands, but <laughs> all the hands are up again. And, whoops. Um, the thing you're actually looking for when you do this is this number, right? Throughput. You want to see what kind of throughput your disk can do. Um, some people might realize that this is related to stuff like your block size and the type of I.O. you're doing. Uh, and there's more to it than the simple throughput you get. But essentially, you care about throughput. So that's OK. But you have to remember there is other aspects to storage. There is the, as, uh, if, you're, if your I.O. is sequential or not, if it's synchronous or not, if it's cached or not, uh, the block size you're using, what's the latency you have. And most recently, what are other things like the speed of your CPUs and your cores in your box? And that's starting to play a role. Um, so I have this example I, I use uh, to explain storage performance to my parents, probably watching this. Hey, mom. And uh, <laughs> uh, the example is exporting coffee from Brazil to Namibia. So I said, why Brazil and Namibia? I said, I'm from Brazil. Namibia happened to be a straight line when I drew it on the map, well, almost straight. And um, I know we export coffee. So I actually had a look, and there's a lot of stuff involved in the, in the production and exporting of coffee. If I pick three of this, which is essentially something that happens at the source, something that happens when you're transporting your beans, and something that happens on your destination, um, we will look that our throughput in this case is not megabytes a second or whatever, it's tons of coffee a, sec or a week, for example. And we can focus on the, um, on, the, um, on, the, on the transport layer, which is what essentially we're doing here. So corners of my screen are not showing up, that's fine. So if you want to get higher throughput, you, you need one of these. You would need a very fast boat, right? So if you, can, if you have a boat that travels at the speed of light, and you can put a pack of coffee in it, and it immediately appears in another continent, and then it immediately comes back, you can put another pack of coffee there and let go, and it's just transport. By the end of the week, let's say you transport a ton of coffee. You can have lots of boats, right? So if you can pack all of these boats and ship them, by the end of the week, maybe you transported a ton of coffee again. 
uh, and you have the same throughput. Ideally, you probably want to have lots of super fast bots, right? So you can choose how you want to transport your things around. In storage, it really depends on your workload. So there are two main categories of workloads um, that I like to classify, which is aggregate throughput and single stream throughput. So aggregate throughput is when you have normally lots of VMs and you have lots of virtual disks plugged to these VMs. And Zen and other hypervisors, they are all very good at handling that. Um, and then you have the single stream throughput case, which is when you have one VM with one virtual disk and you want that VM to to explore your, your storage backend properly, right? So for aggregate throughput, you, you normally need to, to support lots of boats. You, you need a big enough ocean so you can ship all the boats around. And this translates into the amount of memory and processing power you have in your box. Um, and as I said, most hypervisors are good at that because you normally have box with enough processing power and memory for this kind of thing. Now it gets a little bit more tricky when it's single stream throughput. Um, there are two main workloads here. One of them is when, or, or divisions of this workload, which is when you require, require a bulk transfer data. So this is when you can afford um, to put a lot of coffee on the boat. So if you are streaming data, for example, you can read several megabytes of data from the disk in, associated with a single request or as large as your controller allows. Uh, if you're formatting a disk, you know what you have to write, right? You prepare a bunch of data structures, so can you please write that down to storage? So that's, that's very large requests. Now the complicated bit is this particular type of workload when you have uh, small operations. So let's say you're operating on top of a database and you need to read a, a sector from a disk or something, part of an index, so you know what's the next bit of data you need to read or write to. So you're wor working on, on very small operations and then the latency of these requests play a very important role. If, um, if your latency is high, there's nothing you can do because you, you cannot just put more data, say, read me a bunch of data, but I only need a little bit of it. And, and, and that's the complicated bit. That's the bit that um, I'm going to talk about today. What's the complications with this part in a, in a virtualized perspective? Um, so going back to storage, um, there are different ways that user applications can do I.O., uh, on Linux at least. Uh, I think the simplest case that we can think of would be read and write operations from, imagine you write a C program, you open a, a file and you want to do reads or writes to that file. So I've made a little schematics here to show that. You have your kernel space and user space. I hope that's not too small, especially for people in the back. Um, and you have your user process. So let's say you do something like char buff 4k, so you have a, a, a 4k buffer in your user virtual address, and user space virtual address, and then you open a file descriptor, that thing on the far right there is all direct, which means I'll bypass any caching in my, um, in my kernel, I'll try to go directly to the disk for data, um, and then you issue your read, right, you pass your file descriptor, you pass your buffer, you pass the amount of data you want to read from. So the read call you're calling is essentially just a wrapper inside a libc. Uh, libc is going to make a syscall, um, which ends up in your kernel, and syscall will eventually call the VFS read. So even if you were opening, like in this example, a raw, file, a raw block device, your raw block device is an entry in your root mount point um, in your namespace, and it goes through VFS just to find the actual read operation associated with this file. So I put some stars there because if it doesn't have any, it will fall back to some, uh, some, some defaults. And at that point, what you do, because I open well direct, I'm not gonna go through the cache, I'm gonna go directly to the block layer. So basically, what I do is I create BIOs and uh, I submit these BIOs to the block layer. Um, and this, the, when this disk was put down in the system, it, there was a, a driver associated with it. And this driver has one request queue that is registered with the block layer. And this request queue, if you, if you are familiar with the Linux-like things, it's what you see when you go into uh, sysfs, sysblock, device, queue, and then you see a bunch of parameters in there, such as the maximum segment size per request, or the number of requests that can be in the queue, or even your, um, this is something you might have encountered, your uh, elevator algorithm. So if you're using CFQ or NOOP, 
Um, that's all part of the request queue, really. So the CFQ plays a role because when the block layer is putting requests in the request queue, there is something that happens that you reorder the requests before passing that to the device or the driver, or the, or the block layer will do that for the driver. So at that point, the block layer puts a request in the queue, and um, in this request or in this BIO, there is a callback. And it says, well, here's a request, my function returns, and whenever the device is done with that, it, it can interrupt me and say the request completed, could you please call this callback? So at some point, it, and then it kicks the device driver. So another thing the device driver does when it registers the request queue is associate a, a function that says, when you, when you change my queue, can you please call this thing? And then the device driver will pick up that and talk to the, to the device properly. When the request is done, there is a hardware interruption that completes the request. And in the end, your buffer will have its data when everything is completed. So everything in Linux was designed because they assumed that once the request hits the block device, it would take forever to finish in CPU time. So any processor can do all of these things in a few microseconds. And you expect your, uh, your storage device to be slower than that. So if you have network attached storage, like in a fast or a SCS or something like that, it's fine, because the network latency will probably be a lot higher, and this will dominate the, the, the time it takes for this thing to complete. Um, so there are different storage media would respond different at this, at this level, right? And the first thing you do, and I'm sure all of you do that when you first install a system, is um, have a look at the IO latencies for different uh, logical block addresses of this thing. So it can easily be the case. So during, during my PhD, for example, what we're doing is we had a single block device or a single volume that had different characteristics. So part of the logical addresses were RAID 0, part of the logical addresses were RAID 5. And then we had a file system on top of that where you could put the data depending on what you needed. Is it TMP? So I need very fast storage. I'm going to copy this to the data blocks that have SSDs. Is this my var log? Probably don't need fast storage. I'm going to put that into a rate one where I have a lot of redundancy. So the different LBAs behave different. And you don't have to go that far. Um, I, I picked a host, uh, which has a Perks H700. And I created three rate zeros with those characteristics. One of these disks um, is a Seagate SAS. Uh, 15k RPM disk. One of these disks is a, a Dell 100 gigabyte. Uh, there's the, the specification on SSD. And the other one was the fastest disk I could put my hands on at the time. It was an Intel advertised as a speed demon. I asked for lots of them <laughs> in case I burned some. Um, and this is what eventually looked like. So I, I did a bunch of one megabyte reads. So here are the different three, let me start by this, the, the three different storage, uh, the, the different uh, RAID configurations I had. So all of them are RAID zero. The red line is the, the Intels, right? Um, so I have 800 gigabyte of addressable space because I have RAID zero with two 400 gigs. The Dell ones are only 200 gig of addressable space because they were two uh, 100 gigs and the same for the SAS. So there are some funny things we can notice here. Yeah, I see some people look at me and say, what the fuck? That's pretty much that. So there is this drops here every so many intervals. And this is a characteristic of these disks, really. Um, and there is this funny blue thing happening here. Now, you cannot read what I wrote there, because it's trimmed. But that last bit gives it away. So the SAS disks have ZCAV characteristics. Do you know what a multi-zone disk is? No? Cool. You learned something new. This is what a multi-zone disk is. So when you go through your logical block address, this is a different disk, different box, by the way. Um, your throughput can start at 130 megabytes a second at some parts of the disk. And it can end up at 60, so half of that. Same disk, every time you read from that data block, from, from that LBA, you're right, it's going to have that kind of throughput in that range. What happened here is that um, your, your, your mechanical platter looks like a, looks like, imagine it looks like a pizza, right? So you can cut it down like pizzas like that. And you have a, it's rotating with a constant speed. And you have your sectors and those tracks of the pizza. So on the edge of the disk, the sector is bigger. And the center of the disk, the sector is smaller. Um, what you have to do when you're reading, there are three things. There is the time it takes for the head to go to the top of the right track. 
then there's the time it takes the disk to rotate to the right sector you want, and there's the time it takes for the sector to go underneath the head, right? Which is the transit time or the, the actual access time for, for that particular sector. So I, I've put modern in quotes because disks have been manufactured like this for years now. And what people realize is that they can offer more space and more speed by having smaller sectors towards the edge of the disk. So the edge of the disk is the first logical block addresses. So this became a lot more popular when people dropped CAHS and started adopting OBA as addressing schemes for disks, right? So what that means is that once the head is at that position, that sector moves a lot quicker underneath the head. And that's why you get higher throughput at the edge of the disk. So when you put that in the, con in the context of RAID 0, um, it magnifies the effect, of course. It depends on how your RAID is con really constructed. Um, I profiled a NetApp volume a while back, uh, which I tried to create a RAID 0, so the filer wouldn't let me. It says, no, we, we care too much about redundancy, and we cannot let you create a RAID 0. Otherwise, if this dies, your, your volume destroyed. And so uh, I, I had a NetApp guy giving me a hint. He said, Create a rate, um, a rate f I think it supports rate 4 or rate DP, which is the double parity. And then f remove all the spares from your filer and fail the parity disks, and you have a rate 0. So I managed to do that, create a, a LUN on top of the entire volume, and, uh, which is the waffle, right, on, on that app uh, terminology, and um, create a very fast iSCSI link with jumbo frames and everything you can think of, so I can really, really explore the, f the speed of those disks, and I did a profile like this. And it looked like a bunch of waves. And I thought, this must be some TCP funkiness going on here, re renegotiating window sizes or something. And it turned out it was really just the, the, the characteristics of the disk. So I tried different block sizes and repeating regions of that, of that volume, moving around, like I'm going to start on the pick and end up, it really looks like a wave. Because the waffle will create your volume like that. It will say, I'm going to use this initial sectors of this disk with the middle sectors of that disk with the low end of sectors of the other disk. So we balance this thing out, and you end up having somewhat a constant throughput through all your entire volume. So they, they thought about that when, they, when, when you just go there and say create an aggregate or something, you, you, you would sort this out for you. There's been some studies with, um, to, to move more frequently access data to the edge of the disk and the others there. When, when we installed Zen Server, we, we, we thought about when we were doing this, the host installer, we said, should we really install our domain zero stuff in the beginning of the volume or at the end, right? Uh, we decided to install at the beginning for other reasons than performance, but um, I allows people to destroy those other partitions and recreate them and stuff like that without having to worry that they might overrun uh, the root system. So this is one of the things, you understand your LBAs. The second thing you do is you understand how your storage system responds to different block sizes. So you saw on my first slide, the DD, I used one meg block sizes, right? Do you know what block sizes HD parring use? I don't know. It was lower than the DD on that disk. I haven't looked. I don't know if it uses multiple threads, if it tries different block sizes, if it tries a bigger I.O. depth. So some drivers will respond better to bigger I.O. depth. So you can put lots of requests in the queue and then kick the driver. Uh, I don't really know what it does. But this is something important you have to understand before you deploy your stuff. So again, I measured those three, um, those three RAID zeros I had in my system. And by the way, I didn't mention, but this is a very, very big box. It's the PowerEdge RA15. We use it as our, we have eight of those in what we call our VM density cluster, where we try to run thousands and thousands of VMs. Each box has 64 cores. So it has eight NUMA nodes. It's very com things are very complicated in this box. You wouldn't believe it. Things run somewhere, and they boot somewhere else, and you pin your vCPUs to another part of the box and everything is lower, you don't know why. Um, because the access to, to memory is, of course, non-uniform. Um, and we use CentOS 6.4 with um, kernel 3.11, so these are very fresh measurements uh, on top of uh, Zen 4.3, also latest stable. And we see a bunch of interesting things. So we can start with the blue line. That's the, by the way, the x-axis is logarithm scale block sizes. I had more data points up to 128K. So I, I, I measured for a sector, for a kilobyte, two kilobytes, four kilobytes, and then every four kilobytes up to 128, because I wanted to understand some things. Yes? What's the tool you're using there? Um, that's a very good question, very good point. I use a number of things. So this one in particular was with a, a two wide road <laughs> co-latency. But um, it's probably on GitHub. 
uh, if it's not, remind me. But I confirmed all of these numbers using FIO and DD uh, to see if the numbers are, because this is actually measured in latency, not in throughput. And then I just converted the numbers for the graph. Because if you have logarithm scale latencies, it's very unclear. To, you don't see some things at some points. Um, but that's a very good point. Um, you shouldn't really rely on a single tool. I had a customer case recently where he said, there's a problem with Zen server. I'm using IO meter in a Windows client and Dynamo in my Linux VMs. So the IO meter control lots of Linux VMs at the same time. And I'm increasing the IO def, and I don't see it getting any better on my NetApp. Uh, but I see it getting, uh, on my NFS, he said, I see it getting better on my iSCSI. And this must be the ways in server treats NFS there is a problem. So I went to see his, uh, his environment, and um, I did some IO stat in his domain, and I said, I don't see more than an IO request being queued here. Are you sure you're putting eight? He said, yes. And he got faster in the iSCSI. And then I said, can you show me the iSCSI case so I can look at that? And he said, certainly. And then he plugged an iSCSI from an EMC array. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, I don't do that normally. And, um, so it turned out that it was not the MC or the NFS was the, or the NetApp that was the problem. It was really um, um, that his Dynamo was not working properly. The right amount of, of, of it was not queuing the right amount of requests before kicking the every, um, before issuing. And it turned out it was some issue with the, the version of Dynamo doesn't use or direct or it uses and then it doesn't respect the, the queue that. So it's a valid point to use different um, tools, if you can, to, to check your results. So in the blue line, you see that as you grow your block sizes, you scale up to about 400 megabytes a second, and then it flattens out. No matter what you do, those disks are not going to deliver more than that in this machine. The green line, which is the Dell SSDs, it would go faster in 220K and then drop. And the reason why it dropped is because this controller exports its maximum, or at least its driver, exports its maximum amount of data per request to be 128K. This is something you would observe in SysFS. And, um, and what happens there is basically at that moment, the block layer is going to say, the controller cannot take more than 128K requests. I got a read operation that has 132K per request. I'm going to issue one request 120K, another one with four. And, uh, depending on how this reaches the driver, the throughput drops because it's basically getting a one request of 120K and another one of four. And then this, this one would look like two requests of, um, of 128. And, and then this would look like four requests of 128, right? And then you can see how the disk behaves with that. And the red line suffers a little bit at the same time um, on that, that region, but it's less sensitive to that and it keeps scaling up. And at this point, there is something that's harder to see. And um, you can take my word for it. <laughs> you can tell me I'm lunatic. But why is this thing scaling up to 4 meg if the request is, the maximum request size controller that can take, this can take 128K? How can, how can it be possible that I'm issuing a 4 meg read operation is faster? And the answer for that is that the Linux block layer is not efficient. Oh, yeah, you wanted to answer? I asked. Uh, wouldn't it be because that thing actually issue multiple requests for one second and it happens to be fast enough to do so? You would do that. You would do that. But then why is it not just going super up and then flattening on at some point? And the answer, that's, that's perfectly correct. And the answer for that is that the block layer is not efficient enough. It takes far too long to prepare those requests and queue them up and ship them. And the disks are so fast in terms of latency that the time it takes for the block layer to, again, I almost fell down here, I should take a step forward. <laughs> um, the amount of time it takes for, for the block layer to prepare um, uh, all that data and put it on the device is too big compared to the time the device takes to respond to that, right? And you can only imagine what happens when, when you're actually virtualizing the storage, right? And that's why this is such a hard workload to fix because you really cannot spend a lot of time processing. And I'm going to go into some trends of some things, some numbers I collected around, and show you why. Um, yes? I have not tried Infinity Band of NFS. 
because the latency is going to be very small, right? That's absolutely correct. So the, the, the point was, if we try an infinity band on NFS, um, it's not going to be faster than some of the SSDs I'm using, but uh, it might be just just equivalent because the network is seriously quick. So if we look into some trends, please interrupt me if you want. <laughs> um, this is a graph I found that shows the clock speed of processors over time. So if you look in the 70s, we had process cores that were slower than a megahertz. And at year 2000, we were looking at gigahertz processors. This is logarithm scale again. So in 2005, or even before that, we were already looking at three gigahertz processors, right? Now, what are the cores of the boxes you've been buying today? It's three gigahertz. Four, three, four? Oh, four, four. Spend your money on your hardware. Right? <laughs> no, you don't have seven, no. The thing is that there is actually a physical limitation here. You cannot have cores <laughs> faster than five gigahertz or so on silicon-based processes. You melt the silicon, period. Trust me, we've tried. <laughs> you melt the silicon. So, of course, that a 3 gigahertz Pentium 4 is not nearly as fast as a 2 gigahertz i7, whatever, right? The instruction sets got more efficient, but it's not growing on this scale. So I also found some interesting, very entertaining slides of people trying to run a Pentium 4 at 5 gigahertz <laughs> using liquid nitrogen to cool their cores, right? They managed to freeze the motherboard. Um, but it worked. They, they showed that the benchmarks, there's the links there. So <laughs> in a nutshell, what's happening is we, we now have more cores per socket, right? Uh, we also have more e efficient instruction sets but they are not growing in the same scale. It is true, some core, some especially the Intel ones, have some turbo capabilities. So, so this is a really interesting thing when you have lots of, of cores per socket. And uh, do you, are you familiar with CNP states? I see, I'm not so I assume yet. So basically the idea is when, when some of your cores are not doing anything, they can idle down, and then the other ones can be opportunistic and scale up, up to something like four years or something. They get seriously fast, right? And these are the boxes I'm trying to, to get my hands on now to, to, to continue this work. So because of that, you see people exploring parallelism, right? So uh, when you develop things, you, 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 you consider this, uh, parallel algorithms. And then even if you're sorting an array, you're not going to implement a bubble sort anymore. You're going to do a quick sort or something like that. Um, so you don't really rely on the single threads or your single cores getting faster. You rely on, um, on having more cores. Um, and there is, of course, the issues with NUMA, as I said, for that other, um, for that other, uh, other box I was telling you about. It has 64 cores, right? Well, check this box out. That's a ProLiant uh, we have. It has eight sockets. And each socket has 10 cores hyper-threaded. How many CPUs are there? Uh, 160, they are hyper-threaded. Yeah. Well, that's a big box, right? So they are not that fast. They are like 2.2 uh, gigahertz. And actually, someone told me this schematic is wrong. It actually has three boards of CPU. So the, the, there is the cost of accessing uh, memory from certain processors is different than from others. And it's way different than others. That's a lot slower. So there's a lot of things you have to consider, right? But this is the kind of box people buy for, for cloud stuff. Like you put one of those in your data center, you run thousands of VMs. Or you want to run thousands of VMs, right? If that works or not, we can get there later. And the problem is, on the other hand, we're getting this kind of storage disk. Have you ever seen this one? It's now, a, it's now a little bit old, actually. But I think it still costs something like $10,000 per, 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 per card. Um, so this is a PCI Express uh, disk. It's not really a disk. It's basically a memory extension, if you want. So Fusion O drivers, when you install that, will show you a block device that you can put in your system. And then your Linux can talk to it. And you can see a dev FIOA or something like that. You can create a file system on top of that. You can use it, right? Um, but um, 
they actually have an SDK that actually lets you use this memory as just with extension. So you, in very simple terms, you could think of it as I have a 64-bit machine. I have exabytes of uh, addressable area. There is a range there that I can write to, and that's my, my disk. Right? So it's not based on sectors and translations, things like that. It's actually seriously fast. And if you don't have uh, processes power enough for that, you're not going to be able to explore that. So these are the technologies based on non-volatile non -volatile memory that I'm talking about. Um, and that's a profiling of that disk you saw. So this is um, a different machine. It's a Sandy Bridge class processor. So it's a, it's, a fa it's a modern processor. It's not one of those huge boxes. It doesn't even have hyper-threading or turbo, but it has four cores. And uh, this was a single uh, measurement of all the way. Um, so at the end, when I was using my four megabyte blocks, I was actually looking at 1.4 uh, gigabyte a second of, of throughput for sequential read, which is fast. Is yes? Linux, yes. That's the same thing I showed before. You would go through the, if it's a normal read system call with four mag buffer associated with it, and the block layer will create the BIOS. Yes? Sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, no, so that was the same question I got here. I should be repeating the question, sorry. Um, the question was, is this through the Linux block layer? And it is. I was using the, the, the driver that provides that creates a, a, proper, um, a proper block device for its use. So I was using this through slash dev slash FIOA. I haven't had the time to play with the SDK yet. Can anyone guess what was happening here? That's, that's a trick question. The car was overheating. So the... <laughs> Uh, I didn't notice until I went to the host console and looked and saw this, right? So the card was almost at 100 degrees, and it was starting to say, those banks are going bad. Can you please <laughs> slow me down? And um, our, our, our IT guys should be really mad at me now because I went on the BIOS and actually set the fun speeds to, to super high performance, so that machine must be really loud right now. I forgot to turn it off. Like... <laughs> Yeah, it's seriously loud. <laughs> but at least I didn't get those messages anymore. <laughs> you have your eyes really <laughs> yeah, I told you, we burn CPUs, we do all this fun stuff. That stuff. Um, so let me go into, I'm, I've used half an hour already. Let me go into the, the Zen stuff. We're having fun, right? So the last thing I showed you is uh, that diagram, right? So now it's time to show off the keynote skills. And what happens when you have a virtual machine? So, ah, I can't believe you could trim that. But basically, you have uh, your DOM0 and your DOM U, right? So DOM0 is, if you're familiar with KVM, is your host, and DOM U is your uh, unprivileged domains or your VMs. And what we stream Zen use case. So this is if you just download Zen uh, from, from whatever, Git or a tarball and you install it, what do you get? Uh, the simplest thing you can have is you replace your device driver by something called block front, which is a device driver, but it represents a virtual disk, doesn't represent a real disk. And then the other domain, you have something called block back, which is uh, another kernel module that talks to block front. So when block back is ready, it opens your device. It can be a file, it can be a, uh, actually block back has to be a block device. But um, when you tell block back the geometry of your virtual disk, it tells block front. This is the size of my sectors. This is how many sectors you have. And then block front presents slash dev slash XVDEA or something like that inside the guest. And that's how it works. And they communicate via something we call the Zen, uh, the block if protocol. So it's a similar block protocol. There is a shared page between the two domains, which has a ring buffer inside. Block front will put a request in there and kick block back, block back, piece of request, and passes it on to the block layer, which end up in a device, right? The only problem with this is that I'm exporting a full device, right? When you, when you have virtual machines, you probably want to export, to do thin provisioning or, or other fancy things. So I'll present the Zen server use case. So this is true in Zen server 6.2. I think it's been true for a few releases now. What we do is we store the data in VHD format. So this is a, form, this is a disk specification by Microsoft. Um, 
what VHD does is basically puts metadata around every two megabyte, megabyte blocks or something like that. And uh, in the beginning of the file, there is a BAT, which is a block allocation table, and it tells you what blocks are actually allocated. So if you want to read logical block address, address a gigabyte or something like that, you go to BAT, it says this block exists, it says yes, then it, go, it knows where to go and get it. So the data can be uh, all over the place, and that's how you do thin provisioning. So this is how, also how you do snapshots and cloning. So VHD has three types of disks. There's a fixed disk image, which is a fully thick provisioned disk with a VHD footer. There is a um, dynamic disk image, which is the one I was describing. You just have some metadata, and then you grow as you write. And there is a difference in disk. So the difference in disk is an empty disk that has a parent. So it says, if the data is not here, then check my parent. So that's how you do snapshot. You just create an empty disk and say, this is a child of that. Yeah. It's like a copy and write, absolutely. Um, but Blockback doesn't really talk to files or VHD. And, and, and this is where it gets complicated sometimes because we could implement that into Blockback, but then the, the kernel maintainer says, no, this is not something we want in the kernel. So we uh, developed something called TapDisk. Uh, TapDisk is the component that can implement the VHD backend and implements other things like allows you to do the Zen storage motion and migrate uh, VMs without centralized storage, has a, a bunch of things. And the only problem here is how to get Blockback to talk to TapDisk, right? Blockback only knows how to talk to the block layer. So we implemented something else um, called BlockTap2. BlockTap2 is another kernel module that presents block device similar to Blockfront in that way, except that instead of talking Zen blocky stuff with another domain, it talks to TapDisk. And then tap this uses libio together. Oh, I think it was a slide behind. Um, there is the block tap two implementing a tap device, and tap disk talks to the, the talks to block layer again through libio, so you can submit IO requests to any type of backends you want. It can be the NFS mount point, it can be files in NFS mount points, it can be files in a local EXT storage repository, it can be logical volumes in a nice CSI LAN. Um, Okay, so what's the cost of this thing? I mean, clearly the data path is a little bit longer now, right? So if you're familiar with this, this is a Zen Center screenshot, and I've highlighted the actual host or the domain zero, and I did my DD, and this is uh, a local mechanical disk. I did a DD on top of SDA, and I saw 118 megabytes a second with one megabyte block sizes, right? Um, Actually, I also profiled that. You see my count is 500. So I know that the first 500 megabytes, which is what I'm reading, is in the same zone of this disk. So this is a mistake people make. Sometimes they do a longer, I want to measure this for an hour and see the average. And then if you keep reading sequentially, you would drop to those lower zones of the disk. So that's why it's important to, to know the disk characteristics first. And then I did the same test from a VM. I created a virtual disk, again, in the same zone and did the test from the VM and I saw 117 megabytes a second. And that's fine, right? No virtualization overhead whatsoever. And this is what most people see. And that's what they're going to see when they have the RNFS, or they have the iSCSI, or unless it's infinite bandwidth SSDs on the other hand, maybe. This is what they're going to see. They don't see a problem, right? And if I plot a different graph for you, and I show you the red line being the read throughput with varying block sizes from DOM0, the green line being if I had block back connected directly from the logical volume to that VM, and the blue line being the hot path to trap this, to tr through tap disk, which is the longer one, you see that for small block sizes, there is some overhead. But because this disk doesn't really produce any other, um, any, uh, doesn't really produce higher throughput, we request greater than about 12K or something like that, it gives a chance for the other hot paths to catch up. So if you have big enough block sizes, they catch up to the line. And after 64K requests, they're the same for all of the mechanism. That's fine. But remember that this, is not, this red line is not how the red line looks like when we had the SSDs, right? So I have another case, which is the, the case where the guy had a, some disks that from DOM0, he could see 700 megabytes a second. And then he goes inside his YAML and he do the same thing. And he says 300 megabytes a second. And then they call support. Right? And they say, there is a problem here. I bought these really crazy disks, and I cannot fully use them from my VM. 
Yeah. He has an added latency, yeah. So those, those graphs I was showing, originally they were latency graphs, just to show that. And I was trying to test in different architectures of, of processor, different processor classes, actually to show that the processor is making a huge difference here, right? And that's how the graph looked like. Again, in one of those huge boxes, but with things properly pinned to stay in the same NUMA node. And uh, we see the red line, uh, the one megabyte point, they were doing 705 megabytes a second. From block back, they were doing 600 megabytes a second, and the blue line is not really scaling, right? And this has a lot to do to what you were talking earlier with Fuse. Tap disk is in user space, right? Context switching is something expensive, and the time it takes to do that is gonna make a difference. So in summary, um, we have, the, um, we have the, the, the aggregate throughput case, and most subsystems are fine there because we know that the, the boxes are big enough to, oh God. The boxes are big enough to, to handle that kind of workload. So if you have enough VMs, have enough cores, have enough memory, you sort it. Uh, but the single stream throughput is okay for large enough requests unless your hardware is really, really new. And for small requests, we could do better, right? And that's not just us, again. That's something that will happen everywhere. Um, and actually, that includes bare metal Linux as well. I'll, I'll, talk about that. I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, so Fusion AO people are noticing that, for example, right? Um, and and in, in one sentence, storage got too fast. Processes didn't. So th this was never a problem before. No one would ever consider that, well, imagine when they first designed OS and stuff, you had tapes, right? I mean, no one ever considered this stable storage, primary storage, secondary storage, secondary storage would be so fast that the time processing things would actually matter. So we have to look into ways of actually doing less processing and continue to guarantee everything you guarantee, including features. So not only security in isolation, but features like snapshot and cloning and migration, etc. So there are some, what, what, what ideas are we coming up with that? So the question is, how can we reduce the processing required, right? And we start experimenting with things. Um, so if we look at this diagram, we know this, this, um, this hot path is quite big. So QMEQ disk and block tab three actually works, um, uh, they actually work a little bit different. So what they do is, they ditch this bit and they connect this uh, component here directly to Blockfront, right? And imp they implement the block if protocol themselves. So that's got to be faster, right? Uh, no. So it is, it is faster <laughs> uh, sometimes. But what we overlooked is that there are actually more context switches there. So, um, than before, and the, if the context switch is what's causing your problem in your hardware, so this is a very difficult question to answer, said it's better or not, it really depends. It depends because if in your particular architecture, and if you're using a 34, uh, 32 or a 64 bit kernel, or a 34, <laughs> that, um, then maybe the context switch cost is different, and that, that makes up for it, right? Or maybe it doesn't, depends on the box. I know that in 64 bit there are lots of things that are slower. Uh, system calls, for example, apparently are slower. So from a design point of view, the data path is shorter, but the problem is that you still have kernel modules doing the event channel. So the event channel is, uh, if you're not familiar with Zen, that reads why can't it be simple. Um, event channel is basically what emulates a hardware interrupt. So when that VM, that domain, <coughs> needs to tell this domain it did something, what it does is it kicks an event channel. It sets a notification bit on, on some Zen resource, and Zen generates what, for this kernel, is a hardware interrupt, saying, oh, there is something you need to treat, right? So it's a very high priority thing, stops almost anything that's happening in the kernel to handle that. And, um, and then there's the grand device. The grand device is basically this domain says, okay, I have some IO requests here that has some pages that are there that I need to read from to write to disk or write to if I'm reading stuff from the disks. And then you have to ask for permission to access those domains. So this is something that Zen provides, which is a complete isolation of memory. In KVM, this is a little bit different. 
but then provides complete assertion memory between your domains. So you have to ask permission to, to read that. This is through the hypervisor. It goes to something called a grant table. And, um, and there are some costs in that as well. The funny bit is that there's not a lot of cost in mapping the foreign pages. There's a lot of cost in non mapping them. Because when you say, I don't, want, I don't need access pages anymore in you and map, you actually have to, to flush some, some CPU um, um, uh, caches because you have the extra part of to, to an MFN or a part of your memory that you no longer should have access for. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, we have. <laughs> they are not in my slides, but we are looking at them. Um, they are not in my slides because I haven't explored them fully. But we are looking at that. It's, uh, also with uh, aspects to networking stuff, which has a similar, um, similar problems. So one thing that we do is called persistent grants. So this, this became stable in 3.11 already. So if you download a 3.11 kernel, you're going to have block back in there. You're going to have block front in there. And they have support for persistent grants. Uh, the latest stable version of QMU QDisk also has support for persistent grants. And the idea is there, there are a set of grants that, um, that Blockfront gives to Blockback or to the back end, even if it's QMU or Blockback. And then you really don't unmap those pages. You just say, okay, let's keep these things mapped between the two of us. Um, there are some issues there. For example, when a request comes from the user space in the cast, it needs to copy that data to the pages that are permanently mapped. So there is some more mem copying there. But we find that this is less, uh, this is cheaper than doing the end map. So it is a valid solution, right? So um, it's 311 is supported. It helps in some cases. Um, it doesn't really cut, it doesn't really give you bare metal performance, right? But um, it's a tricky one. So there's the indirect IO as well. So um, the block if protocol has some limitations in the amount of segments you can have per request and, um, and the amount of requests you can have in a single page ring. So the, share, the, the data shared between the two domains. And the indirect IO allows you to, to have much bigger requests. So you can even afford to maybe merge requests coming from the block layer in Linux. So Linux has a physical limit, uh, has a, a sub limitation of a megabyte per request in its block layer, it's hard coded. I never bothered to look why. Um, it's quite unusual to get requests that big anyway. So it is a sensible number. Um, so now we can actually afford to, to, to pass requests bigger than that. Indirect is also stable in 3.11, but I don't think there's user space support yet. Um, something called split rings. So split, split rings is a different thing. So we, we, what we have is a single page ring between the two domains. And the guest put a request in there, kicks the back end, the back end passes the request on, and when he has a response, which is basically, yeah, I finished writing what you asked me to write, or I finished reading, he puts the response back into the same slot of the ring, and then kicks the, the, the front end again, or the, the guest again, says, that's done. Uh, with split rings, we could have two separate rings. This would very easily allow for the back end, for, for, so the idea of the two separate rings is, the front end will put requests in a ring, and pick up response in another ring. So we can have two separate event channels, and we can configure in the back end how many requests you want to pick from the ring. So if you are having a workload like formatting a disk or just reading a bunch of small data, you can actually pick this request up for the ring and the ring is never going to end. You can pick as many requests as you want. So you can have cooperative backends. You can have people in the backend saying, yeah, I'm going to uh, pick uh, up all these megabytes of data requests. And then another VM says, wait, I need some, some requests in flight as well. And then they can, okay, I'm going to slow down here and speed up there, be fair. You can implement lots of things. And you don't have to be bound to this idea of a single race. So we have some, some prototypes for that. It looks promising. Uh, and this also helps with CPU caching. So with one single page ring, if you have the, this domain writing requests and this domain writing the responses to the same position of the same page, you're trashing the caches if these guests are running different vCPUs or pCPUs, actually. So if you have the two vCPUs running and you have separate rings, you've got to have one domain always writing here, one domain always writing the other one. So that also helps. And then there is this multi-queue approach. So this is something, as I said, this is not something exclusive to, 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 to any virtualization platforms affecting everyone. Um, have you heard of someone called Jens Expo? It's a, a kernel maintainer for, for block stuff. Uh, he worked at Fusion IO. And they said, we, we picked some of these NUMA boxes, some of these big NUMA boxes, and we tried to see how we can scale uh, lots of threads so that they have 
They just have bare metal Linux, and they run a thread right into the Diffusion IO disk. Actually, what they did is they wrote a NoTap driver. So um, I, I, I wrote on myself, and then I realized they had done one. I took them theirs because it's much better. Um, it's basically a, a device driver that just completes requests immediately. So it's as fast as you can possibly get, right? Um, and the idea with that is they notice that when they, they, they have one thread talking to that, so that's a, an infinite uh, device, in, in essence. If they have one thread writing, running on top of one core, and they start another thread, and they start another thread, and start another thread, what happens? And what they notice is that there is a point when you cross the NUMA nodes, when you go to separate NUMA nodes, the throughput drops. And that's because you, you have costs of accessing memory, and you have a single request queue. So they, they made a proposal, and they showed how that scales well, and they're implementing. I think it was scheduled for 3.11 when I saw the presentation. Is it Matthias something, and, and Jens, and a couple of other chaps? And they, uh, I think it might go into 3.12. And um, the idea is you're going to have a request queue per core on your box. So they are trying to change the block layer to respond to that. I don't think this technology exists yet, but what eventually you might get is file systems that run on top of NANDs, right, for this kind of stuff. But it's, it's tricky when you have customers that buy this kind of disk because they are in the market, and then they try to run your virtualization stuff on top, and they say, I'm not getting it. And then you have to say, okay, this is what we can do. We can tune this, we can tune that, we can do this and that. But this is kind of the research we're doing. So I'm more presenting a problem here than a solution. If you have systems you'd like to try that, feel free to try, try these technologies, get involved. We have a, a Zen server. Zen has always been open source, of course. You have the Zen develop mailing list. Uh, Zen server is now fully open source. You have the Zen server develop mailing list where we're discussing these things. We have the IRC channels. Um, there is a, a lot of opportunity to get in touch. If you, if you have ideas, if you have opportunities, if you want to research something together, we're, we're open to that. And I finished at 52 minutes. Uh, there are eight minutes for questions, I think. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes? Can you tell us a bit about the juicy bits you learned about you know, different processors and everything? You know? The Intels are a lot faster. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, the Intels are definitely a lot faster. And you have to be careful if you're profiling these things. You should disable those turbo modes. Because you can think, I fixed it! Look how fast it is! And then you try it again, and, it said, uh, and, and the, turbos didn't, the turbo didn't kick in, right? So um, uh, prefer smaller boxes if you want faster I.O. Because if you have lots of cores in a ship, it's more likely that the, the frequency of those clocks are going to be lower. If you look at the, the table spec from Intel, you see that chips with 10 cores are normally smaller uh, in, in terms of clock speed. So go for smaller boxes, maybe with more sockets, and um, avoid NUMA for now. <laughs> I know we're low on time. Do you have to take to another one? If But is there there's a no situation such a thing. where a spinning disk can provide a greater bulk throughput than SSDs? If, if, sorry, say again? Do you ever see a situation where a spinning disk can provide a greater bulk throughput than if SSDs? I've, if I've seen cases where um, spinning disk can provide greater throughput than SSDs. Not recently, but I'm no. sure it can happen. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you can, even, even one for one, one disk for one, you can have faster uh, disks. I saw a really interesting study on in a conference last year, a couple of years ago actually, it's called Some Like It Hot. You can Google for that. The idea was that you can, if, when SATA disks are fast, or when SATA disks are hot, they can be faster than, than enterprise class SAS disks and things like that because they don't have protection for temperature. So they speed up. So the guys burn a few disks doing that, but they showed that it gets faster. So it's an interesting point that sometimes you, if, if you work in the IT part, you change one degree Celsius in the temperature of a data center, and all of your servers get faster or slower. Because if it's a little bit cooler, maybe the, tur the turbos can kick in. If it's a little bit hotter, and depending on what you're doing, maybe your disks are faster. So there's, there are interesting things there. It's not easy. <laughs> so for the 10 seconds before it ends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> really yeah. Well, the, the, pr the processors have this kind of protection, right? If uh, if you remove the fan and you put a soldering iron next to 
to Pentium is gonna to any, any Intel processor or any processor at all. I think they're gonna slow down to its minimum multiplier. It's gonna run at 200 megahertz or something like that, but it's not gonna melt. I mean, if you touch the soldering iron, maybe. <laughs> but they protect themselves quite well. Some does. <laughs> Are we good? Yes. Oh, um, yeah, sorry. There, yeah. Always, uh, there always used to be a problem with um, Linux with fast I.O. things like Fusion I.O. cards where, the, um, where there will be a request go to the block device and the block device will generate a, the device will generate hardware interrupts back to the yep. device driver. And you could quite often see a problem where the first core on the machine was getting absolutely swamped dealing with hardware yep. and that actually block the flow of I.O. from the device. Is that still an issue? I think IRQ balance has worked that around and it allows you to. So there is this thing which is, I'm not entirely sure how that works, but that what happens is the, the, the device generates a hardware interrupt. So the hardware interrupt handler has the highest possible priority in your kernel. And what it should do is schedule a software interrupt to do something and then return and the, schedule, the software interrupt can be scheduled to handle it again. And I think the software interrupts are balanced out properly with stuff like RQ balance. You can actually pin, I want this stuff to go to this process, or, or I, I can get back to you on that. I know who knows the answer. Um, but that's, that's a, a good point as well, just to finish on that. There is, um, this is one of the concerns. For example, when we get an event channel, which is a, in essence a hard interrupt, what we do is schedule a, key, a kernel thread to wake up and not a software interrupt. So this is even more fair in terms of scheduling. And uh, there was a lot of discussion on should we use software interrupts or kernel threads. So th there was discussion around that. But I think it's pretty much sorted. I, I, haven't, I don't know about this kind of problems anymore. I haven't heard of anything in a while. Hello. <laughs> you mentioned about disk edges and the position about? the disk edges about the position yeah, of yeah. data on disk. You also mentioned about that nice HP 960 with the problem of memory being further away from CPU. Yeah. So that's the reason that on SSDs, some of the memory chips are further away from the controller than others. Can you drive mm. stuff fast enough to make that a problem? I've never really encountered that, but I know that there are some new Dell PowerEdge servers, I think R720, and they have two slots on the front of them for two drives. They actually came up with this crazy thing. It's a SATA connector that has a PCI Express thing in the middle. So there are some micron drives that have a PCI Express uh, connector, but you shove it into a SATA port. So I think vendors are coming up with their own specification for these things. And to use the second bay, you need the second processor. If you have, it's, a dual, uh, it's a dual socket motherboard. And if you're only using one processor, you cannot use a drive in the other. So that might be a case where there is a limitation on that, and the hardware prevents you from plugging that, but it might be because of the wiring of the thing, or that then the performance would be horrible. Um, but I'd never, it's a good point that it could be the case that maybe the performance is different because the drive is in the wrong port. It's definitely a valid argument. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.